Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 120, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Now, this is a podcast where every single Friday, Ravi and I talk about the goings-on in the world of retro gaming, which to some people might sound a bit like an oxymoron. How can there be things happening in the world of retro? (laughs) There always is, you know. We talk about retro gaming, but we also talk about retro technology. We, we cover all aspects of retro. New hardware, new games made for classic systems, and we reminisce about the glory days. But let's think back a little bit. Before the days of podcasts, where did you get this information from? Either through rumours at school or magazines or basically seeing it on television. And if I didn't see it that week, I would be absolutely confused and just not know what is going on at all. You're right, because... Sometimes I'd forget to put a videotape in for like the TV shows that were on. No catch-up back then, no websites, no YouTube, nothing like that. So really, it was a way to find out the news. And, and television did it faster than magazines. Because you had weekly shows here in the UK, like Games Master. Well, daily shows like Games World as well. Yeah, exactly. And that was how we found out the news and the game reviews to find out what was cool. And we did do a show about a year ago about Games Master. Yeah, Games Master was a bit more adult and it was, you know, your your cheeky kind of gaming, wasn't it? It always had a lot of innuendos in it. Yeah, ones that probably went completely over our head when we were kids. But there was another massive show and I loved it as much, if not more, than Games Master, actually. And I used to rush home from school to watch this. Never missed an an episode of it. And that was Bad Influence. Yeah, Bad Influence was absolutely amazing. Do you remember the data blast where... All the data would come and you'd have to pause your video and then kind of skip through the frames to read all the cheats or reviews. Yeah, that was like a magazine that was kind of tacked onto the end of the show, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like one minute where they just blast you with information. (laughs) You had to pause every frame on your old video, try and avoid the flickering at the top and bottom of the VHS tapes. And I love their like stateside um, reports with like Z Wright. Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah. So they'd have like reports on the new thing from America and it would often be something absolutely crazy that millions of pounds were spent on and massively failed. Yeah, Silicon Graphics workstations or virtual reality back in like the early 90s. And it was on at such an interesting time because Bad Influence began in 1992 and the main consoles then were like the SNES had just come out. The Mega Drive was inexpensive, but it was still there. And you watch those early episodes of Bad Influence. They were still doing like Spectrum and Commodore 64 NES stuff in the earliest episodes. And by the end, it was PlayStation and N64. But also it wasn't just gaming. They covered technology as well. So they covered the technology at a time. And the guest we have on today was a presenter from Bad Influence, Andy Crane. An integral part of the show. Now, Andy Crane, anyone that grew up in Britain in the late 80s or early 90s will remember shows that he was on the broom cupboard with Ed the Duck. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of these shows were live as well. They'd be, like, live in the morning or in the evening. It was, it was really good. Even Motormouth on a, a Saturday morning. I remember they had uh, they played Magic Pockets on there and you'd ring in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> left, left, up, down, right. <laughs> and the and guy would control it. <laughs> yeah, it was a guy behind the camera with a joystick, I'm sure. Because I know sometimes they'd get it wrong. And the person on the phone would be like, no, I said left. And the person had died on screen. And What's Up Doc that was on after that with yeah. Hugo. That was like a game they played. And, of course, Bad Influence. Andy, even the Top of the Pops for a bit as well, back in the late 80s. Oh, we go into everything in this. Jason and Kylie. It's a, a real <laughs> flashback, this episode. So if you've got any nostalgia for television, kids TV in the late 80s, early 90s, if you remember Bad Influence, this is actually the first podcast interview that Andy Crane has done about Bad Influence. Fantastic. So we're going to find out all about that. The inside story of Bad Influence coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in around 15 minutes from now. Now, speaking of podcasts, we have to give a little shout to our good friend Retro Man Cave, Neil. Oh yeah, he's started a new podcast. It's quite a cool concept, actually. It's called Desert Island Discettes. Yeah. Like Desert Island Discs on radio. I got the reference. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And uh, it's basically kind of your favourite game tunes that you talk about. And if you were trapped on a desert island, what game tunes you would have or or kind of computer music. So it's really good. He's actually getting a cracker on there, a convicted cracker. Right. And uh, (laughs) this guy's going to, you know, talk about courtroom tales, computer piracy. And of course, we had Galahad on. So if you want to check out some other knowledge, I think this guy's from Quartex, which was a a quite big cracking group. So, you know, some really interesting stuff that's being explored on that podcast. And they kind of talk a bit about their story. Then you get like a a chip tune mod or something. Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. And I heard maybe someone we know might be on a future episode. Yeah, we'll see. 
<laughs> you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to check it out, I mean, we had Neil on the show a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? And I love his YouTube channel. And this is a really good listen. I enjoyed the first episode. And you, you've been betraying us, haven't you, Dan? You've been on another podcast. Yeah, this one was called Crossed Wires. Um, short Circuit. Really good chat, actually. Um, if you want to have a listen to that, I put it out on our Twitter the other night. It's kind of just me reminiscing about my history with computers and stuff as well. So, Sounds good. Yeah, so I'll put that in the show notes as well. You'll find all of those at theretrohour.com. Now, that's also the same place if you would like to support this show. Because every week we do mention this, you know, really quickly, it's just a way that you can help us out with the running of the podcast. Because doing a weekly retro gaming podcast, coming in studio time, going out to retro events and all that, it all adds up, website hosting. Oh, definitely, with events as well, because all the events are coming up soon, aren't they? They are. There's some massive ones happening this summer. So if you want to make a donation into the running of the show, that is massively appreciated. Every penny, every cent, every euro, every dollar, it all goes back into the running of the podcast, and we accept PayPal or cryptocurrency on the front page of our website, theretrohour.com. And for making a donation, you will find your name in a future episode of the podcast in the Hall of Fame. Just like Mike King, Matt Amer, Edis Mehmet, Adam Dimmick, who all made donations into the running of the show, and you can do the same at theretrohour.com. And starting from this week, there is another little way that you can support the show as well, and uh, get yourself some nice goodies for doing so. Now, I've hidden a little Easter egg at the end of this week's podcast. If you're into Atari, don't miss it. That's all I'm going to say. You got to listen right till the end, though. Exciting stuff. <laughs> so Ravi, like his eye, eyebrows raising, what? What? To make sure you listen. Atari. Right <laughs> <laughs> to make sure you listen, we we'll do that right after the interview. I actually have some of the stuff, so yeah. Yeah, you are an Atari fanboy. You're kidding, no one, Ravi. Tell nobody. <laughs> so that's coming up after the interview with Andy Crane. Make sure you listen right to the end of this week's show for a new little Easter egg that you can find in this week's podcast. Now, before we get into the interview, there are some stories we need to talk about because 2018 has already been a massacre on the high street. What is going on? Oh, it's absolutely crazy. So I'll tell you a story. I went in to buy some games and I went into Derby and I was walking around and there's That's Entertainment. You know, That's Entertainment was this kind of DVD, CD place. It reminded me of HMV 15 years ago. Yeah, That's Entertainment. a whole place shutting down. I've put pictures of it on Twitter. The whole place was shutting down, but there was like boxes with xbox games for 50p yeah and they had like all the cables it was like a car boot sale they were even giving away free cd cases and stuff and then i went down the road where trade nation is trade nation had been closed down they had a a sign on the front saying that had been shut and also granger games they've announced has been shut down so they're saying last year in england they had six thousand outlets go from the high street a rate of 16 stores per day. Closing down. Closing okay. down. So I don't know what it's going to be like this year, but the high street is getting savaged, isn't it? Well, we've had Toys R Us obviously go in the yeah. last month or two. I was in town here in Nottingham um, yesterday to go into Maplin, which, you know, we did mention a couple of weeks yeah. ago. They're out of business now. And they had some kind of sale on, and it was like 50% off some stuff. And it was quite sad, though, because I, I have, I've actually got a video on my YouTube channel, um, should be out by the time this podcast gets released, of me walking around, and I did a little filming on my phone, and I thought, you know, they're going to tell me off for filming. No one cared, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I thought yeah. I'm leaving in a couple of days. <laughs> but I got like a NAS drive, you know, to put media on for my, uh, my home server. And the guy there who works in the shop, he goes, oh, that was a good bargain, that, isn't it? You know, he said, I would have bought that, but, you know, I haven't got a job after Thursday. Oh, man. And I, I said to them at the end, I was like, you know, cheers for all the years of good service, guys. But it was, Maplin been on the high street for 40 years. And Granger Games was another place that I'd kind of do a little circuit around town. I'd do Maplin. I'd go to our local independent game shop, Playtime, mm. that closed down last year. I'd do, you know, the game and game station, all that stuff, which nearly went. HMV that nearly well, went. Well, well, there's rumours about CEX as well, isn't there? So, you know, it's like Trade Nation as well when we used to go there. Yeah. Um, it was a fairly new shop. Um, always very, looked very good. It wasn't like these places were run down or anything. The main problem that they're all stating is that they don't have a retail presence. Now, this has happened with uh, online retail presence. Now, this has happened with a lot of British companies. So Primark, for example, their money has gone up massively this year in sales on the high street, but they don't have an online presence. No. And it's it's absolutely insane for me how they think that they can compete with uh, all these places around the world, on, you know, even on Amazon and all of these sites. For me, it's a bit tragic, though, because I mentioned all those stores there. Most of the places that I go to town to visit 
are no longer there anymore. Mm. So then I'm looking now and I've got very little reason to ever make a trip into town. That's it. Unless you want a coffee or you want to get really drunk. <laughs> or, no... or, or cheap clothes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's That's like it. no reason to go on the high street anymore. And it's like, it is a bit sad, but I guess, you know, we are kind of to blame for it because I was in, uh, you know, except when I was in Mapling the other day, even the stuff that they had on sale, you could still get cheaper off Amazon. Yeah, and with the stores as well, I guess it's stuff like Steam, you know. When the physical stuff gets replaced, like with the PC, and I came in, I was going into game and stuff, and they had all these, like, cards that you just redeemed. You didn't have any game boxes or anything. Yeah. And it was kind of like you go into the game shop just to go to the game shop, not to actually buy anything. It's, yeah. well, my, my brother said to me, you know, before Blockbuster went bankrupt, he said, I'm wandering to Blockbuster to look what movies to download on Friday night. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, you know, it. it's difficult because customers are not going to support it if the prices are higher. It's, it's, it's better for the consumer online. That's that's the bottom line. Prices are. So. But then in Maplin, I found their service was very good, though, and they'd all be knowledgeable guys in there, passionate about electronics. And if you ever need help or support or just like a friendly face to have a chat with, you kind of you don't get that online. That's it. They've got to offer something different. And like John Lewis, for example, they offer a huge warranty of something stupid like twelve years that you're yeah. not going to get online. So a lot they're doing well in their electronics department and stuff. They need to innovate and think of something that they can offer. And at the moment, it's not. If they had VR sets and they were doing demonstrations and they had all the PlayStation Move out there and everything, maybe maybe it would be good. But you know. I even find that about game shops. And, you know, game obviously went bust and got saved about a year and a half ago. And game, you know, if you're outside the UK, that's kind of our version of GameStop. It's like the main yeah. high street video gaming store. But you go in there and compared to, I remember being a kid and going to Electronics Boutique and Future Zone. And it, on a Saturday, it'd be like an arcade. It'd be rammed. Yeah, and we'd now be there's like the games. five or ten people just wandering around looking confused. But they have like yeah. one PS4 set up you can play on. Back then, it was like, you know, you get like desks and they'd have all the systems set up and everyone could play games and try them out and all that. But it seems like the fun's kind of gone out of it. It's yeah. not a fun place to go anymore. It's very sterile. And that can't help. And even then, they had like a PlayStation VR demo on. You'd have to play a tenor to go on it. And it's like, you know, it's meant to be an advert to sell it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's the mainstream ones and there must be some independents doing some good stuff out there, you know? Well, that's the thing. If you actually know of any good independent gaming stores, we've said this before on the show, if there's somewhere maybe in your city or your town where you go to buy your retro video games and they do a great job, drop us a tweet at Retro Hour UK um, or you can email us show at the Retro Hour dot com. We should maybe get a little directory going of like really good local yeah, independent yeah, shops. good idea. It's always good to support your independent local shops because that's the thing, as we know, because our local ones have gone in They've the all city. gone, yeah. Yeah, you either use them or lose them, really. So. That's it. We'll keep an eye on that. I wonder who'll be next on the high street to vanish. Oh, God. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about France.com. Yeah, so we have Michael Laurie on. And uh, Michael Laurie was uh, uh, into the early domain registration and he had Harrods.com. He's and a he, cyber squatter. Yeah, and he <laughs> ended up getting sued for that. Now, um, this gentleman, um, Jean-Noël Friedman, has basically owned France.com since 1994. And he's been working with the French government, actually, and listing events and, you know, uh, he's had loads of interaction and he's had loads of tourists. Now... The idea is that France.com was a, a website to kind of help tourists, give them information and stuff, and it's actually been seized now by the French government saying, we own this because it's France.com. Yeah, it's very strange. And now he's doing like, he's suing them, isn't he? Or the, or he's, the... he's suing them and he's also made unfairfrance.com. Hmm. So you can see the whole story and the history of France.com. But it's, it's, it's odd, isn't it, that you can get these kind of legal decisions where government agencies can just steal a domain off someone, even if they were doing something positive with them. It wasn't like it was an anti-French site or, you know, anything like that. It was very positive, helping the uh, tourism. What's more shocking is that he'd owned that for like 25 years and his domain registrar obviously just handed it over as soon as he got this notice, I imagine. Yeah. And that could, I can understand if it's a company, but a country? <laughs> Shouldn't they have France.gov anyway? Isn't they .gov? Said, They're not a company. You know, he, he does not have an official permission to use the domain, but he bought it off the net nomination. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he's, and they're saying he's been acting in bad faith. 
Yeah. Well, who, who does own the trademark to France? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> like, you know, it's, again, it's obviously a website that's aimed at people outside of France for tourism. If it was in France, wouldn't it be Francais? Yeah, Francais.com. <laughs> yeah. I mean? So I just think that's outrageous that that can happen. And I think good luck to the guy. I hope he gets it back. The fact that he'd had it that long as well, and obviously he was trying to do something positive with it. Well, the fact that it's all over the BBC and stuff now shows yeah. that, um, you know, he may have a good chance. So, not, the best, vi- not the best PR for the French government. No, really, visit Unfair. Fairfrance.com. So yeah, if you want to find out more about that, we'll put that. And the rest of the stories every week, we'll link them up in the show notes at theretrohour.com. You haven't got to go Googling or searching around anywhere. We do it all for you. Now, we did get some really sad news in the week that Rick Dickinson, who was a designer of many classic Sinclair computers, passed away. Oh, they always had that really nice look, didn't they, the Sinclair computers? They look really classy, I think, even though a lot of them were very cheap. Was he involved in the calculators at all? Or? He did the um, design for the ZX80, okay. um, ZX81, uh, the original Spectrum. He did the, uh, the Sinclair, Sinclair QL as well. That was a oh, really wow. cool-looking machine. Yeah. And, I mean, you look back, the ZX81 won, won a British Design Council Award for design, you know, back in 1981. Yeah, it's iconic. In terms of British computers, it was a really pioneering look and something that people recognise all around the world. And what's actually quite sad is, recently he was involved in the design of the Spectrum Next case. Ah, okay, which is the new uh, remake, the the continuation of the Spectrum. Which looks amazing. Have you seen the case for that? It looks fantastic, yeah. But it's it's kind of, it's nice that even though he's going to go, there's still something that he's done that's continuing and kind of going to be used in a popular item. Well, it turns out he'd been ill for a while, but I don't think really anyone in the community knew because he had been interacting with the Spectrum Next group on Facebook and he'd done a few posts in there, then he just kind of vanished. I think he went to America for some treatment. Yeah, He'd been suffering from cancer, but um, unfortunately the treatment didn't work. It is a bit tragic that he didn't quite get to see the Next getting released and have one in his hands, you know, because yeah. it's just about to come out very soon. But um, yeah... It, what a sad loss. And we did put the news out on Twitter the day it got announced last week. And I'm looking, we still get retweets on our phone like every 10 minutes at the moment. Yeah. And it made like even Sky and um, you know the BBC covered it as well. So it was good that people are recognising just how pioneering his work was and you know how important it was. And iconic. Community. Yeah, absolutely. So rest in peace, Rick. Really sad news. Now, let's talk a bit about Polymega. Yeah, I don't know anything about this, but I'm going to hear lots about it. Well, 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 you might know about it because it was called the Retro Blocks, and we covered it a while ago. Okay. But they actually changed their name. So what it what it is is it's a modular gaming system. Okay. So this is this is crazy. It's like you know you used to have your hi-fi with your separates. I'm a stack system. Yeah, your stack system. That's what this is. This is a modular stack system, but for retro gaming. So there's been a lot of recreations of consoles recently. Now, the Polymega will do the uh, PC engine, the Mega Drive, the uh, NES and the um, Famicom. And it's also got SD cards, USB, CD-ROM drive. And you can basically get these individual units, stack them up and create this giant beast of a console. And it will have on the individual unit the kind of um, port for the original controller as well. So I'm looking at the SNES one. You've got the yeah the, the little connector for the SNES control pad. Yeah, and it will have a collection and a kind of a big interface. Now, what's happened is um, they've recently released a video of them creating the 14-layer PCB, and this looks really sweet. So we'll link that in the description, and I reckon this uh, Polymega is going to be the next kind of small console that everybody's talking about. It looks really well made. And I love the fact that it is like a, a stack system. It reminds me a bit of like when you got a Mega CD one and you clicked on the bottom of the, the Mega Drive. Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. where you had your Mega Drive and it kind of stacked and stacked, but this goes even higher. Yeah, this would be like having your 32X and then all sorts on top. I wonder how tall you can make it. Yeah, that'd be it. <laughs> Start adding in new custom ones. And the fact that you could have a Mega Drive and then the CD-ROM underneath it as well. It's got an optical disk drive in there too. I love their little tagline on here as well. Um, compatible with games for systems like the PS1, Sega CD, Neo Geo CD. Why not invite some friends over and party like it's 1999? Oh, yes. And uh, Turbo <laughs> Graphics as well. And the control pad looks really good. You know, if you want to use the one that they bundle with it. Yeah. We've got like a Bluetooth one. Reminds me a bit actually of the um, Nintendo Switch Pro Controller. Yeah, and I love the kind of um, matte 
grey look of it. You know, that one's not going to go yellow, is it? I do remember we did talk about this last year when it had a different name, didn't it? Yeah, Retro Blocks. Yeah. Like this one, yeah. And this is the one that's got built in Twitch st- streaming in as well. Yeah. So you can stream your old games on and Twitch. YouTube directly, and all of this, yeah. Which is really good because if you've ever tried to hook up like a Mega Drive to a capture card and then. Put Elgato it on Twitch Madness. And, oh, yeah, lag and everything introduced. So. Hopefully, we'll be seeing a lot more kind of retro streamers using this. I, I'm looking at that, and that will be a use that I think of straight away. So, yeah, really cool. Any idea when this is going to be out then? Uh, I think they're going to start the marketing campaign in a few months. So, expect to see it absolutely everywhere. Yeah, cool. Definitely got to get hold of one of these, I think. Look, really, really cool. Right then, well, uh, thank you for checking out the news section of episode number 120. We will be out again next Friday. Of course, the Retro Hour podcast is available from all of your favorite podcast services, including. Google Play Podcasts. Oh, yes, and Player FM as well. I saw that we were on that the other day. I'd not seen Player FM before. Yeah, there's a guy who tweeted us, and it's got like a little nice little widget that you can play in Twitter. Oh, uh, that cool. was really cool. That's so, nice. And we have got a few requests for people going, now, why don't you get on this service? So we are trying to get on them all at the moment. We're on everything but Spotify, yeah, so <laughs> Spotify for listening. We're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, a new episode will be out again next Friday with more news. Don't forget to keep listening right to the end of this week's podcast for this week's Easter egg, especially if you are a fan of Atari. Worth hanging around for that. And now, let's get the inside story about one of our all-time favourite gaming and technology shows, the inside story on Bad Influence with Andy Crane. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome this week's very special guest. Welcome to the show, the legendary Andy Crane. Very generous of you. I'll take, I'll take legendary any day. Notorious, <laughs> possibly, but legendary is good. Thank you. Well, I mean, anyone that grew up in Britain um, around the time Ravi and I did, you know, in the 80s and 90s, um, will have very fond memories of the kids' TV shows you used to do back then. Um, we'll get more into those in just a little bit, but I mean, going like right back to the beginning. You started broadcasting on local radio in Manchester, is that right? It was then called Piccadilly Radio, it's now called Key 103, and it's about to change its name again to Hits Radio, yes. Um, although it wasn't in Castlefield where it is now, it was in Piccadilly, um, over Brentford Nylons, and I did my first show there in, oh, 1983. So yes, commercial radio, pop radio in Manchester, I was 19. So what made you want to get into broadcasting then? Was it always kind of a dream from when you were a kid? I suppose. I mean, you know, like a lot of kids, I discovered it by tuning around the radio by accident. And, you know, it's again, you'd have to be probably even younger, older than you. But radio stations had a massive local presence back then. Piccadilly Radio was commercial radio for Manchester. There was Piccadilly Radio, BBC Radio Manchester and the National Network. And that was it. And with the greatest respect to Radio Manchester, at, you know, 15, 16, 17, I wasn't interested in that. And there it was, slap bang in the centre of Manchester. So it was accessible, and I listened to it, and I liked it, and I thought it seemed like a reasonable way of making a living, really. It's one of those... We didn't have media studies courses, right? But he just thought, well, why can't I just write to them and see if I can be on the radio? It never occurred to me not to, really. I'm, I never, I've never had that famous conversation with the careers master who says, what do you want to do? I want to be on the radio, and they all laugh at you. Every presenter will tell you that. I didn't have that. I just wrote them a, a letter, although I was living in America at the time, but I wrote them a letter and said, can I come and work at your radio station? And they wrote back and said, yes, as long as it's for nothing. So did your family have like a history in broadcasting or, or oh, anyone God else? Lord, God, no. It was a massive disappointment to them that I wanted to be a disc jockey. Um, they, my parents were both teachers, uh, and I think they had uh, university and professional aspirations for me. Um, and I was an enormous disappointment to them when I, A, didn't go to university, and B, ended up on commercial radio. I think I redeemed myself when I did a couple of shows for Radio 4. My dad, my dad thought that was better. When I was back on BBC Radio 4, that was OK. And 5 Live, that was OK. Uh, but uh, I'm teasing. I, I, didn't, I just thought they thought it wasn't necessarily the most secure career option I could have gone for, and they didn't really see how I could make any kind of living out of it. Thankfully... Um, I have done, and, you know, people are still letting me get away with it. Well, I'm not going to do the math how many years later it is. But no, absolutely no history of broadcasting in the family at all. Well, it must have been kind of strange moving from radio into television. Um, were you were you kind of stuck with radio when you were thinking, ah, oh, this is going to be a big scary thing? Um, no, again, these are massively different times, remember. This is 1985-1986. Um, and again, we haven't had media studies courses. We don't really know how TV works. It just appears in a box in the corner of the lounge. Um, 
But the transfer from me, from radio to telly, was dead simple because I started doing disc jockeying on the telly. Essentially, continuity is being a DJ on the telly, isn't it? You, you, you introduce, you back announce one program and you introduce the next one and they give you a count in your ear, which is essentially like talking over the intro of a record. And I was used to not working with scripts because I'd come from radio. So the job is actually a perfect transition from radio to television because it is being on the radio, on the telly, or the nearest you get to it, really. That's what the broom cupboard was like. But uh, no, again, I, I had a friend who was working at the BBC who sent me a, a little note saying, you'd be good for that children's BBC thing. And I had never seen it because I was doing afternoon radio, so I watched it and I sent a letter into Pat Hubbard and a, a showreel of me on the radio because nobody had camcorders or f- f- cameras on your phone or anything like that. So I had no v- video of me. Um, I sent him a photograph and a, and a, and a showreel and he said, um, come down for an audition. So I went down and did an audition being on the radio, on the telly, essentially, although you've got to remember to look at the camera. But apart from that, it's pretty similar. And we went to the bar afterwards and he said, that was very good. Would you like to do three weeks on BBC Two? And I said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks so much. And then I went home. And I'm sorry, I'm not underplaying it, but it, it, I look back now and I'm like, bloody hell, Craney, he offered you three weeks on BBC Two. It was a huge thing. But it wasn't really. It was like he just said, well, do you want to be on BBC Two? And that's how it was then. These days, you have to jump through about a zillion hoops, don't you? You know, to even get an internship somewhere. It was just a completely different time. I wrote a letter. He wrote back. I did an audition. He gave me a job. It was that straightforward. I always wondered when watching The Broom Cupboard as a kid, I mean, did you actually sit there and watch the cartoons like we did? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, a couple of reasons. A, because they were funny. I mean, I watch everything, but... Uh, a lot of it was, was great. We enjoyed it. But also because if it had broken down, and occasionally it did, you had to pick up. You know, you had to, and, and if you were, you know, not in the, or you couldn't leave the broom cupboard, that's what continuity is. You've got to be there to do backup if it fails. So you'd have to be able to pick up and say, oh, that was a shame. I was looking forward to seeing X, Y, or Z. Because the impression is you're watching the programmes and you could have laid up with a lot of egg on your face if you weren't. But to be honest, there wasn't much else to do, really. We were sitting there. You know, we had our links between the programmes. The big links were at the beginning of the afternoon and the end. The links between the two were only 10 seconds. The links between the programmes, really, were literally 10 seconds. That was, this is, coming up later, bish, bash, bosh, you know, a bit like radio. So there was not much else to do. We had our links for the more for the 10 to 4 and for the 25 to 5 neighbours link all planned. And the rest of it, we just sat there chatting, watching the telly. And it's like, honestly, it was money for jam. It really was. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did get a sidekick, obviously, the, the famous Ed the Duck. Um, Eventually. Yeah. There were lots before him, but he's the one everybody remembers, yeah. How did the idea for Ed come about then? And what was it like working with inanimate he characters? Great. I mean, it wasn't, you know, again, it wasn't reinventing the wheel. I mean, Philip had had Gordon. There was a brief period of time where I came in and I didn't have anything. There were some various things, there were various, there was stuffed fruit, there was Bobby the banana for a while, and I think there was a carrot, and those were the bits and pieces. Um, but Ed came from a market stall in Hong Kong, um, and was found by um, the lady who helped him perform, let's put it like that. And when he first arrived, he didn't look anything like he does now, and he, he didn't sound anything like he does now. He was given a bit of a makeover, and he had a hair, new hairstyle, and his voice broke, but it was hilariously funny because he could get away with all the stuff that you can't get away with as an adult. It's a bit like being interviewed by a puppet, isn't it? Um, or a character, you know, Mrs. Merton or Roland Rat or, uh, or the, um, you know, Zig and Zag on Big Breakfast. They can say things that the sensible grown-up presenters can't say. So he can take the mic, he can be silly, he can be funny, uh, he can be the butt of the joke, he can be rude, and it's all great fun. That's that's the joy of a, of a character like Ed. Well, you also presented Top of the Pops. That must have been a massive gig at the time. Now, there was a massive gig. Now, there was something even I was excited about. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't wish to be glib about, you know, being radio and telly in the early days, because it wasn't. I was hugely excited, and it was brilliant fun. But when I was offered Top of the Pops, which is coming up 30 years next month, it's June 88 I did my first Top of the Pops. Um, I was, again, I'm sorry to keep going on about this, and it doesn't happen anymore because there aren't any bars in BBC buildings, but we were in the bar at the BBC, <laughs> and the producer of Top of the Pops was called Paul Ciani, and Paul Ciani's no longer with us. And we were just chatting away, you know, because that was what happened in the BBC bar. You met loads of people, and you just got chatting. And he said, you've got lots of people around about 15 to 16 to 18 watching, haven't you, because of that neighbours thing? And I said, yeah, it's doing very well. He said, would you like to bring the audience with you to Top of the Pops, please? And I said, well, I'd be delighted. What do you mean? He said, would you like to come and present Top of the Pops? 
Um, and I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> now that I was excited about because I'd been a DJ on the radio in Manchester. Top of the Pops was something you aspired to do. Kids Kelly had never been on the radar. But Paul, standing in the bar up with a pint of lager in his hand, said, do you want to come and do Top of the Pops? And internet, a trivia question, they are, a trivia question, first ever non-Radio One presenter to present Top of the Pops. Well, there, there you go. There were loads after me. Um, you know, I think Karen Keating did it, Nancy Turner and various others. But the first ever non-radio one presenter on top of the pops, yours truly. So that's, I mean, I think I'm in a trivia game for that somewhere. <laughs> well, in that era, you know, the 80s, I mean, kind of getting this round to games, um, you know, computers and consoles and video games and arcades, they had a huge decade in the 80s. Really the decade where, you know, the golden age of video gaming, recent, really. Did you have an interest in it then? And like, did you have a console at home? Were you playing games or going to arcades or anything? I got a console having joined that influence. It all came latter rather than free. Um, did I go to arcades? Occasionally. Did I play Frogger in the pub? Yes. You know, stuff like that. When there was a console in the pub, it's Space Invaders, you know, we, we all had a... Um, a Pong game, didn't we, and Pac-Man and stuff like that. But I wasn't going every Saturday afternoon racing down to the arcade shoving endless 50 p's in, no. Um, the consoling gaming at home, which was, I'm sorry, uh, retro gaming podcast listeners, wasn't massive. I'm not a massive gamer then or now. I enjoy it. It was a fun thing to do. Um, and I got a Mega Drive and, um, and I had a Game Boy and I think I had a Game Gear. Game Gear, that's something to come to you with. Um, it's one for the teenagers. Uh, but it was mostly after joining that influence, which was, again, offered to me by Patrick on the back of the technology that was in the program. Many forget that, I mean, that influence wasn't just a game show. Uh, Games Master was. Games Master was purely games. That influence was a gaming and technology show, and I was employed as a presenter primarily because of my interest in technology and, and computers and computing and what they could do and how they were influencing society. And the way to hook the kids in was to do games reviews. So the gaming was Violet's area, and I was employed primarily as a presenter with a kind of, you know, factual background. Um, but I played the games just like anybody else, yeah. Well, what was kind of the, the way the show was sold to you originally then, the, the original idea behind Bad Influence and the concept? Uh, the executive producer was called Patrick Tickley, um, and he had worked on BBC Micro Live, and I can't remember how it came about. I joined ITV because I'd left the BBC when I was in Saturday mornings on ITV, and I can only assume we met at some of one of these big press launches for ITV children's schedules or something. And we were chatting away, and I'd done a series of uh, the travel show, and I was chatting away and telling him how we were on the beach in Greece, and I'd got the cameraman to take his camera apart and show me how it worked, because it was a, getting a bit really geeky now. It was an Ariflex film camera, which has a rotating mirror, and it's all very geeky and technical. But I was fascinated by that, and so I, I got the cameraman, took his kit apart and showed me how it worked. Patrick remembered that and he said, you really like that kind of stuff, don't you? I said, oh, yeah, if I could present Tomorrow's World, I'd bite their arm off. He said, well, what about a technology program, Technology Tomorrow's World for Kids? And I said, yes, please. Um, and then that's sort of how it happened, really. And then Violet was brought in because of a gaming experience and, a, uh, and a, I wouldn't be blogging back in there, magazines and journalism and stuff like that. And it all seemed to work rather well. Um, but it was, it was, there was no, you know, it wasn't sold to me as it's all about technology. We knew what we were going into, uh, and we knew that games were going to be, you know, one of the main focuses of the program because it was, you were right about it, but it was just, we were, on the, we were on the crest of a wave of home consoling. The SNES had just come in, and the, the Mega Drive had just come in, and the idea of having a joystick in your own lounge plugged into your Mega Drive, although it was quite an expensive bit of kit back then, was fantastic for kids. It was like this was only something you could do in the arcade. Now you can do it at home, plug it into the back of your telly. So we, Patrick was very astute, really. He realised that by doing this programme, he could win an audience and he could you know, do the technology that he loved to do and he could engage the kids through the games. I think it all worked rather well. Well, you know, hearing you then talk, um, you know, it kind of resonated with me that I've always been a geek all my life and interested in the technical side of stuff. I mean, were you kind of the same? Were you that kid that kind of dismantled things around the house to see how oh, they worked? Yeah. Or? Absolutely. I built a radio station in my bedroom from a cassette player and an old record player before I was even on commercial radio. I was, I was the, like um, other presenters, I built my own radio station. I used to record the jingles off the radio, not the, not the songs, and then put them into little cassettes and edit them with sellotape so that when you press play, the jingle would fire straight away. You know, I, I, radio was all I ever wanted to do, but I knew how the kit worked. So I took my cassette player apart endlessly and put it back together again. And the same with the, 
with the, the, the turntable. We're back into radio geekery, not games geekery here, but I learned how to cue records myself. I had a turntable and I realised that if you just took the motor off the turntable, you could put the needle just near the beginning of the record, then when you press play, it would go. And I since realised, as soon as I got in the radio station, that that's what the jocks did. That, and I was like, oh, I, I, I'd worked that out for myself, you know, because I knew how kit worked. So, yeah, always doing stuff like that. Sometimes when I put things back together, they didn't always work the way they should. But most of the time it was all right. You know, kids don't change bike tires anymore, do they? They don't put, they don't do punctures and take the inner tubes out, do they? Or maybe they do, I've no idea. But, you know, I was always taking my bike to bits, putting new handlebars on it, changing the saddle, you know, faffing about. And then when I got my first car, it, back in those days, you could play with it. It was an old Mini. And you could get the handbook from the library. And if you needed the carburetor changed, you changed the carburetor. These days, it's about 500 quid for them to look at it. But, you know, I've always been hands-on, if I could be, yeah. Well, I watched a few um, episodes of Bad Influence that are on YouTube. I don't know if you knew the whole lot of them are on YouTube now. Apparently so. I, <laughs> I haven't seen an episode of, of Bad Influence since the day they were transmitted, and that's not because I'm, like, snotty about it. I just, I haven't. Uh, I, people say, oh, have you seen this bit? And, and, you know, people tweet me the odd thing about phrases we used to use and ask me questions about it. But my knowledge of it is sketchy, to say the least. But, yeah, occasionally I think, oh, shall I? And then I go, nah, you know what? <laughs> I will leave it as a very fond memory because I suspect the reality of watching it back is, is is not as fond of the memories I have of it. Well, there were a few segments that I saw you do on there, and, I mean, there was one where you went to, um, like, a special school, and there was kids that were doing, like, virtual reality um, who couldn't actually get out in the real world, and there was another one that I saw where you actually went to Blackpool Pleasure Beach. And... I remember doing that. I, got, I, did, I went on the big one at Blackpool mm. Pleasure Beach 17 times for that film. By the end of that film, my fillings were rattling. <laughs> I'd gone that ride so many times. There's a prime example. This was a story when the, the, the big one at Blackpool Pleasure Beach had failed and people didn't realise that rides were controlled by computers. Now we take it for granted. And Patrick said, that's a great story because it's about technology and how technology is where people don't realise it. And Patrick was so ahead of his time. I mean, virtual reality now, you, you know, I mean, it would have been pretty primitive back then. But it, somebody knew that it was going to be something that would ha- enable people who had uh, difficulty moving to experience things. And so it has proved, hasn't it, all these years later. And now you take technology for granted in everything, from your telly to your car to your dishwasher to your mobile phone. But we were introducing the idea to kids that computers can do more than Word and email, although we didn't even have like that then. But it was it was these things are going to be an important part of your life in 25 30 years time and look what happens if somebody hacks into you know a, a, a global network the world grinds to a halt they're not only are they part of our lives they're crucial these days i mean that's what bad influence was about it was saying be aware of this stuff you know if we could have predicted facebook that would have been astonishing wouldn't it but be aware of this stuff and what these bits of kit can do because they are going to be hugely significant when you are a little bit older than you are now. Well, you also covered uh, stateside news as well with uh, Z Right and Z Right. <laughs> yeah, there was always some interesting devices and uh, concepts on that as well. Yeah, that was uh, that was a bit of a, a, a shame, really. I never got to go to America. Violet used to go and film in America because she was available. Because I used to spend two days a week making bad influence, and then rush down to Kent and spend two days a week making Saturday morning TV. Um, and my fairly new wife and my newborn child were like, after the rest of the evening, come home now. You're not going filming. Come home and be with us. So I never got to do much at any of the American filming or any of the location filming. But Patrick and Violet and the team would have a great time in the in the U.S. Um, again, perhaps they were slightly ahead of their time or it was a slightly different take on it. You probably have better knowledge of the films that Z-Light made than I did um, because I didn't see them on the show. They were edited afterwards. So we'd introduced the film and then we stop recording and then we move on to the next item. So the actual films, I probably saw them when the show was transmitted, If I, when I watched it at home. But uh, again, not really any massive memories of, of, of what was in them, I'm afraid. I think what it did prove is, though, it, how much bigger the world seemed then. Because having a segment from America, it's the only way you could Ooh. find out about it, really. Yeah, it was extraordinarily exciting, wasn't it? Um, and, you know, travelling to America, even for Violet, was a huge deal. Um, now, you know, you can log on and watch American TV. You know, you can FaceTime somebody on the other side of the world at the touch of a button and nobody bats an eyelid. But, yeah, you didn't know what was going on in America. And America was um, was seen as this kind of, you know, amazing place where lots of technology was happening. It still is, I suppose, Silicon Valley. It's, you know, the home of all the major technology companies 
no, not all. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that. It's unfair to games developers and people who are working really hard in this country and in Europe. But, you know, Silicon Valley is still seen as this place where all this technology is, is being developed and, and, and advanced. Um, but we know about it in a heartbeat. Now you click on a website or something and there it is. But, yeah, to, to bring America into your living room technology-wise was another thing we were proud of. Well, where was Ban Influence filmed as well? Because I always thought the set looked really cool. That's very kind of you. I thought it looked pretty cool as well. But I still get people asking me where they can get those tellies that look like they were concertinas that we used to use for the for the monitors. <laughs> it was made at Yorkshire Television in Leeds. Uh, so I'd travel from London to Leeds to make the show and overnight there and then come back the day after. Um, it was uh, probably made on a Wednesday and, 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 and edited and put out on a Thursday, I think because I would then go to Kent on Friday to rehearse Saturday morning TV. I can't remember. It's too full. But it was made at uh, Yorkshire Television on the Kirkstall Road in Leeds. Because you were doing Motormouth on a weekend. Uh, yes, I was. Um, uh, and latterly, what's up got? Yeah, but uh, Motormouth was... There will have been rehearsals on Thursdays and studio rehearsals on Fridays and transmission on Saturday. So to be honest, I, I bet it was Tuesday, Wednesday or something like that, wasn't it, that they made Bad Influence. And then it would have been transmitted on the Thursday, by which time I'd have gone to Kent. So I'd have to remember to set me VHS or, or I wouldn't see it. You know, the, the idea of iPlayers and Sky Plus and View Again and all that, completely different back then. You just literally had to put a tape in the box and remember to set the video. Um, and sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't. I think probably somewhere I may have the odd VHS of me on Bad Influence. I've definitely got my first Top of the Pops and I've definitely got some episodes of Saturday Morning TV. I'm pretty sure there's a cardboard box somewhere with some episodes of Bad Influence in it. I remember on Motormouth as well, I mean, talking of gaming, you had like a, a game where people could call in on their phone. Um, I think it was Magic Pockets that you had on there, and the kids would be on the phone and they'd like tell the character what to do, like move left, move right. I always wondered, was that just like a guy with a joystick behind the camera? Or Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, probably. And then when I went to Saturday morning TV in Scotland, when Motormouth, when WhatsApp got moved to Scotland, we did we had a character called Joe Rouse. His graphics were a bit better. Hmm. But yeah, it's, a, it's essentially that. You were, you know, they were shouting and somebody was having to, you know, because we wouldn't have voice activated software or anything like that. Um, and it was literally a kid on the phone. So somebody would have to react uh, as fast as the kid was giving them directions. Um, for those of us who are really old, it was like a modern day version of the golden shot. But you probably don't remember the golden shot. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to Google that one. Yeah, I'm looking it up on Wikipedia now. <laughs> Um, did you watch any of the other shows like Games Master and stuff and did you see yourself in competition or was it a different audience? Entirely. I, I suspect there was a crossover in the audience. I didn't watch Games Master. Um, and I think Games Master used to take the piss out of us a bit. And that would be fine because they were dead cool and it was Dominic and they had the Games Master and all that. It was Patrick Moore, wasn't it, the Games Master? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But we were a kids' TV programme going out at 4.30 on a Wednesday or a Thursday afternoon. We weren't, you know, trying to be edgy and cool like Games Master. It was just that there were only two, so hey, let's make a rivalry out of it. You know, I, I, I didn't feel there was any kind of rivalry. We were both doing entirely different things, not for entirely different audiences, because, you know, people who like games would watch what there was available, and there wasn't much available back then. Um, but I didn't feel that we were rivals, and I suspect, although they... Um, made a bit of a fuss about it, I suspect they knew the truth, really. It was just about... They, they were very keen to be the cool and edgier program and I suspect by virtue of the fact that what channel they were on and how they were presenting themselves they just were but no I don't think Violet and I felt that we were anything other than a complimentary program to Games Master Well you work with the uh, the lovely Andy Weir um, who was Namrood on Bad uh, Yes indeed yes yeah. Yeah, Where did um, the idea of that character come from then Namrood? Nam of course Namrood is of course a banana ground back door but I think everybody's since figured that out but at the time, nobody had. And then occasionally some kid, the penny would drop and they would send in a little postcard or stop me in the street and go, I've worked it out, I've worked it out, and I'm rude, his back door. It's like, yeah, well done. Um, I, I, I think he's very much a, a product of the executive producer's imagination, that character. The kind of room that he lived in, the language he used, Scotty Firkland. <laughs> <laughs> I liked all the language. Andy was very good at that, but Andy was just an actor. Um, again, I don't know whether he's a gamer then or now. He came in, you know, put on his costume, learned his lines and performed brilliantly. I mean, he brought the character to life. But uh, where it came from, I can only assume Patrick. You'll have to get Patrick on this podcast. He'd be a really good guest. 
Absolutely, yeah. Well, cause I know Namrud did kind of vanish after the first that like, couple of series. I mean, I, I heard that he wasn't popular with girls or f- female viewers or something. Not all above my pay grade, I'm afraid. Decisions are made in television and radio, and sometimes they tell you why and sometimes they don't. I, I, I go, there may have been an executive decision further up the, 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 the chain of command that they wanted to make it more accessible. Um, and, you know, um, and, and nerdy, geeky types weren't accessible. But I couldn't tell you that was the definitive version because I actually genuinely have no idea. In fact, you reminding me that he wasn't on has reminded me. And Sonia Saul came in. I remember Sonia coming in and doing a series with us. So there were changes, yes. Do you, do you kind of remember how popular it was? Like, anybody stopping you or, or you know, was it bigger than other projects or smaller? It was going simultaneously with Saturday mornings and I'd just come off the broom cupboard, and the broom cupboard, by that point, had got neighbours at half past five. And in whenever, what year it was, when Kylie married Jason, it's around that time, and the, the audiences were like 13 or 14 million. It was ludicrous, ludicrous audiences, because neighbours, had everybody had gone crazy for neighbours, and there were only four channels. And so everybody was watching neighbours between half past five and six, Monday to Friday, and by default, not by any kind of, you know, talent, um, I was just getting this enormous audience. Ed and I were hugely popular and hugely well-known by virtue of the fact that we were on Just Before Neighbours, nothing else. I mean, Ed was great, so we liked Ed. Um, and I was just holding on to his coattails, really. Um, uh, so I got stopped a lot in, you know, the late 1980s and the early 1990s. There wasn't really anywhere you could go without somebody. Everybody was very nice. People weren't horrible. They, you didn't get trolled on Twitter. I'm very glad, actually that we didn't have social media then. Life would have been very different. I am not as famous now as I was then. If I, was, if I was at the level of fame now that I had enjoyed then, I think the social media experience I have would be very different now than it, than it, than it is. It's very nice now. People are very nice and they go, oh, we like Bad Influence and we like National Willie Frog Day and all of that stuff. But, you know, some of my more well-known colleagues get some really unpleasant stuff on social media. But back then, it was just people coming up going, oh, hello, can I have your autograph? There were no selfies, no cameras, people didn't bother you. They found a bit of paper, you signed it, and they wandered off again. Uh, But, yeah, people liked it. Gamers liked it. If I went to the toy shows and stuff like that, people were very keen for me to come and be on their stand. Um, You know, please will you wear our Sonic the Hedgehog T-shirt and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember the whole Neighbours thing because they were releasing music and, uh, you know, it's kind of England falling in love with Australian culture, wasn't it? Was it was indeed, yeah. And Kylie's I Should Be So Lucky is around about that time. I mean, Ky- somebody realised that, you know, Kylie Minogue was, was the potential to be a major star. I don't know whether they realised that she had quite the star quality she has and she would be still knocking out an album all this time later and touring and being hugely successful and still massively popular. But... Neighbours was a phenomenon that if you weren't there and experiencing it, it's a bit difficult to explain. It's difficult to explain to my kids that a children's programme, well, to be fair, that children's programming that finished at half past five had bigger audiences at 5.30 than I'm a celebrity, get me, get me out of here, has now. Yeah. You know, it would just not, I'm just not saying it's any better or worse, but commercial television dances in the aisles if a show gets 8 million viewers now because the, the audience is so diverse and there are so many channels. You know, we got 13 and a half million watching us do the broom cupboard. Just ludicrous figures. But times have changed, haven't they? Well, I think the Neighbours thing also tied into the, you know, the thing we said before about the world feeling a much bigger then. And you'd see, like, all these good-looking people in the sunshine. And when you'd be watching that from, like, you know, your bedroom in Stoke while it's raining outside, it would be like a bit of escapism, wasn't it? Yeah, and it was romantic, yes. And, and yeah, it, it was even further away than, you know, America. So... It, it, you're right, it's, you have to put yourself in the shoes of a child in 1988 in Britain um, and realise how life was for them. I mean, you know, I grew up in the 1970s. I mean, I've been watching that programme on television where they, you know, where they cook meals from all the different decades. Yeah. And you get to about 1976 and you go, oh, there's my kitchen. You know, that's what my mum used to make. And it, and it, suddenly you are back there and you realise what a different time it was. We, even, even now, at 54 years old, I take my smartphone for granted. I take my email for granted. I take all the technology that I can enjoy for granted. I forget how different the world was. And I was in the mid-20s, you know. So for a kid, it must have just been magical to watch Neighbours. Utterly magical, wasn't it? 
Well, you touched on, um, you know, kind of the, the trade shows and stuff that you went to when you were on Bad Influence and the toy shops and stuff. What did the gaming industry think of Bad Influence and did you have much involvement with them? Personally, no. I mean, I don't know what they thought of it. I, I think they liked Violet more than me. And I don't mean that, you know, like they didn't like me. But Violet was perceived as the gamer. Violet, people knew very quickly that whilst I learned the lines for a review or I would tell you a little bit about this or a little bit about that, you know, we were more interested, I was more interested in showing you what the technology could do or talking about, you know, how you should dispose of your rechargeable batteries and how this is going to happen and how that's going to happen. Um, I think Violet had, had had already contact with the gaming industry and magazines and the like, and she maintained those. And I think she maintains them to this day. I think Violet's still quite active. Um, looking at our Twitter feed, anyway, in, in the gaming world. But I would go to, you know, they weren't gaming fairs, it was the toy fairs, you know, the, the big, huge uh, launches at Earl's Court for what the toy industry were going to be selling to the retailers for the following year. And you just get invited along to see the stuff and try them out because they, you know, they know you're going to, these days, they'd expect you to tweet about it, wouldn't they, or put it on Facebook or something. But it was just, you know, they wanted a photograph, they wanted, I would go with my friend Steve Johnson from Saturday Morning TV, and we would just go along and have it. It was just a great day out, really. We just had a laugh with it. But they were very keen for you to be photographed holding their toy or give them a quote about something, you know. So that's where I got my first Game Gear. I was given a Game Gear at one of the toy fairs. Now, I loved the Game Gear. But, my God, it burnt through the batteries, didn't it? Because it was a colour screen and it had six batteries in it. Whereas, like, the Game Boy only had four and it, was, it wasn't backlit. It was a black and white screen. So it burned the batteries like crazy. But yeah. I really like the I really like the game gear, but it fell out of favour, didn't it? Well, I remember you had to. Yeah, you're right. Cause it lasted a, a, a couple of hours, really, didn't it, with the batteries, and they were Stop. expensive for a kid. Yeah, they were. And we did a we did a comparative piece on the telly with various handheld consoles about how long they last and stuff. And Patrick was quite scathing about the game gear, and I had to say before we, we said you're not comparing apples with apples here. You, you must make a disclaimer that. You know, if you want a colour screen, if you want it to be backlit, then you will burn through your batteries. You can't just say, oh, the Game Boy's great because it lasts longer, because that's not fair. But, you know, with the caveat that, yes, these are the things this other one can do, but you will pay for it because you'll have to buy squillions more batteries. But, um, you know, no, I just read it with the mains adapter all the time. I just had the mains adapter plugged into it. But it's good fun. I remember playing Mickey Mouse Castle of Illusion on my Game Gear endlessly. I really liked it. You know, you're talking about all the thinking of all the systems that came out during those like four or five years of bad influences on TV. I mean, you started with the Mega Drive and the SNES, and by the end, it was like PlayStation and N64 or Ultra 64, I think it was called at first. I mean, did it feel like it was such a rapidly changing industry, and was it quite hard to keep up with it all sometimes? I was kept up to speed by a very good research team. Now, remember, I refer you to our previous remark I am not a gamer, I wasn't a gamer, and I'm not a gamer. I don't have a console anymore. I think there might be a PS2 in a wardrobe upstairs from one of my girls. I've only got, and again, I only have daughters, and I'm sorry to go down that route. These days it's different. But boys were gamers and girls weren't when my children were younger. They're all in their 20s now. So I didn't have um, the gaming experience at home. I didn't have a son going, Dad, can I have an Xbox? Dad, can I have this? Dad, we'd sell the whole thing as sort of faded away from me. But they would show me what the latest technology was and I'd be like, wow, that's amazing, you know, the first PlayStation coming out and the disc going in and, oh, it's wonderful stuff, rather than the cartridge. Graphics getting better and better and better. And these days, I mean, you know, you watch Click or Swipe on Sky or the BBC, the games are phenomenal, aren't they? Mm. Absolutely phenomenal. I just wonder whether I've left it too late to dip back in. You see, I think if I got back in, I'd be so far behind. that you know, the last game, <laughs> the Street Fighter game, Street Fighter 2, I think, you know, you look at the graphics on that and you think, that's moved on a bit now, hasn't it? I'm not sure whether I'd be any good at anything like that anymore. <laughs> My daughter plays. She's got a boyfriend who's got, uh, would it be a Switch? Would that be Nintendo, right? Nintendo, yeah. Yeah, she's, and, she's, and he's got a PS, whatever the latest one is. And so they plug it all in and they play online. Playing online, can you imagine, back in the day? You know, we did a piece on Bad Influence about how you could make an international phone call for the price of a local call. Because, because we were talking about VoIP, um, you know, uh, using the internet for, for voice conversations. But obviously, back in, even then, back in the day, you had to pay for the internet dial-up at home. And your friend in America would have to pay for the internet dial-up then. But that was the idea of put a headset on, talk to your computer, your computer talks for free on the internet to another computer, and they, you could have a, you know, you've made a local call, but you're making an international conversation. 
now you put your headset on and you're talking to kids all over the world and you're all playing the same game or you're working as a team on something. I think it's brilliant as long as it's not all you do. Well, I wonder what Bad Influence would be doing now. Bad Influence would be defending children who play games but encouraging them not to play them all the time. Remember, video gaming was at one point seen as, you know, the, the thing that was going to ruin children's lives forever. And it still gets blamed for a lot of things, doesn't it? Screens, or more, perhaps more generically, screens are blamed for ruining children's lives. Um, but video gaming particularly, um, oh, they're all playing these games, they're all shooting people, they're all going to grow up to be mass murderers and psychopathic killers. Hey, guess what? They haven't. The idea, we, we would defend gaming on Bad Influence as well. Sometimes when the newspapers had headlines about it, we would, I would hold up the newspaper and say, look, you may have read this well, and then we would you know, put our side of the story, put the gaming industry side of the story, because it isn't, it's just a leisure activity. Um, and as long as you moderate it and don't spend 24 hours a day, 365 days a year in your bedroom with a headset on, it's just another way of, having, of spending your money and having, enjoying your leisure time. I think it's a fantastic pursuit. Well, back then, magazines were kind of uh, an authority, you know, gaming magazines, and even Bad Influence had a short-lived magazine, I remember. You did, you remember. And, I, and again, I have a copy of that somewhere in my house and with its free gift cassette stuck on the front. I don't quite know what that was, and there was a picture of Violet and I. There was even a piece in one of the magazines about how we made the title sequence, I think. But uh, they were, yeah, you needed to get a good review in whichever what whichever magazine it was, and you will remember the titles of the magazines better than I. But, you know, if it got this out of 10 or that out of 10, it was absolutely crucial. It was a bit like film review programs before the internet came along. Um, now, you know, you look at IMDb or you look at Rotten Tomatoes or you just go on a, on a blog and see what people think of films. Back in the day, it was, what does Barry Norman think of this film? Will I go and see it? Yeah, the magazines were massively significant. And Bad Influence having a magazine, again, a little bit ahead of their time, really. They, they, they wanted to try and branch out. Now it would be everywhere. You look at the amount of magazines that are tied into TV programming and the kind of merchandising that goes around TV programs, it would be a huge thing. It was a bit speculative, a bit tentative back in the day. We were trying out something that TV programming really hadn't done. You know, magazines associated with TV programs now... You know, you have a magazine, you have a live show that everybody goes to at some kind of arena, and the TV show, and the, you know, the playback show, but I suppose briefly there would have been a DVD, et cetera, et cetera. But again, it was all rather, all rather new and tentative. There were a few editions. I didn't make any money off it. So <laughs> there was no extra payment for being in the magazine. But uh, I, I don't know how many there were. Did it get to four or five? It might not even have done that many. Yeah, I remember there's a couple of them, yeah. I don't think it lasted very long, but... No. Yeah, like I said, it was an interesting concept for them to try, though. Well, it was, but they were trying to dip their foot into an extraordinarily competitive market, and there were some very well-established players there. Mm. And Bad Influence was a children's programme, whereas, you know, back to this thing about Games Master was cooler. Was there a Games Master magazine? I think it's still going now. Yeah, yeah. it outlived right. the show massively, yeah. yeah. Exactly. But that would be a cooler thing to buy a magazine for, wouldn't it? Remember, the, kid, the people watching our program, mass, not huge magazine buyers, and if you're buying a magazine about gaming, you want the gaming magazine. And Bad Influence was not an exclusively gaming show, so there was other stuff in there about technology. But if you're just wanting games reviews, you're going to buy a gaming magazine. And maybe it was trying to be too many things to too many different people, and in a competitive market, it was never going to work. Well, you mentioned about technology then. You know, the biggest technology probably in history uh, came around during the time that Bad Influence was on air with the rise of the internet in the mid-90s. I mean, did you kind of see a change there and did you really have an idea how big the internet was going to be? Yeah, oh, man, if I'd known that, I'd have bought shares in Facebook and Google. <laughs> uh, you know, wouldn't we all? No, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think people at the, who were there at the outset of the internet realised quite what it was going to become. I, I don't think anybody... We knew that computers were going to be part of our lives in terms of, as we referred to earlier, the technology of making life easier, faster, better, slicker, controlling things. Now we've got, you know, fridges that will order milk for you when they run out. You know, you can drive home and think, oh, the central eating's not on. Tap your phone and switch it on. That's what we thought. The social aspect of the internet... I'm not sure anybody really predicted that. I thought maybe people... It was called originally, wasn't it? The Information Superhighway. <laughs> yes. So it was going to be like a reference tool. I think people thought it was going to be like a massive Wikipedia. 
but it's become so much more. But nobody knew that then, absolutely not. You know, that, that you could watch TV on it, that it would have so, social media. You know, we were excited by texting. You know, so social media is just, I don't think anybody realised quite how massive that was going to become. We certainly didn't. We had no sense of it at all. It's another education market as well, because I remember around then it was like, you know, multimedia, um, like encyclopedias on CD-ROMs. They thought they were going to be massive and every kid would want one, but obviously no one really did. Well, because they became obsolete very quickly, didn't they? Yeah, yeah I, had, I, had a, a, I had a I had a two-speed CD-ROM drive in, a, in my, one of my first laptops, which is the size of a small piece of concrete these days, a massive great thing. But yeah, I had various CD-ROMs. I... There was a Microsoft encyclopedia, the name of which escapes me. I can see the CD. Encarta, was it? That's the very one. That's the very thing. But now you don't need it. You know, it's like uh, there's a DVD player under my TV here. I can't remember the last time I put anything in it. It's, it's also my sound system, so I use it for that now. But no, I, you know, things become obsolete very quickly, don't they? Um, yeah, we all thought we were going to have CD-ROMs and multimedia was terrific. People devoted huge amounts of time and money and R&D to it and you know, suddenly nobody wanted it anymore because the internet was providing it much quicker and much faster. Yeah, I think there's that Philips CDI. I think Philips lost like billions on that project. Yeah, it was... Well, and you know, and so did Betamax because everybody went for VHS. Yeah. Sometimes the power of hindsight is a wonderful thing. Everybody can spot what, should, what happened and why it happened. Yeah, 20 years later, it's really easy. But knowing at the time, I mean, I thought Encarta was a fantastic thing. It was amazing. Um, you know, I have, a, my computer was running Windows 95. I remember being at the launch of Windows 95 with Carol Vorderman, Jonathan Ross, David Emmanuel, um, and Bill Gates came over and gave a demonstration of Windows 95 to, I think there were 10 of us from different walks of, I hate this, celebrity life. Mm -hmm. um, and Windows 95 was like, oh my Look at this, you can click on this, and oh, it was just amazing. You know, where, how far we've come and how fast. I think, is there a, isn't there a graph somewhere that charts the progression of technology advancement, and it suddenly goes, whoosh, practically vertical, because ever, things have happened so much faster, so much quickly. The speed of progression and the speed of advancement has increased massively, uh, uh, you know, in the last two or three years. There was a long, slow development of technology and then silicon chips and you know the, the, and then suddenly boom it's like practically vertical the speed of, of, of technological development if you look what you can do now that you couldn't do five years ago it's amazing but compare it to what you couldn't do 10 years ago and it's like light years ahead so nobody could predict it and uh, and i'm amazed still about what we thought was amazing during that influence we had a computer that came in that could provide some really amazing graphics, but it was literally the size of a trunk. It was huge. It, took, it had taken three or four men to carry it in. It had come from some university in Kent. The, you know, the power was probably less than the iPhone I'm holding now, and it was literally the size of you know, two or three suitcases piled on top of each other. But the graphics it could produce for the time were astonishing. People were crowding around the monitor like gasping. But the computer was enormous. It was like, you know, three feet by two feet. And we have a guest on this show where, you know, they're talking about the first PlayStation prototype and it was the size of a photocopier. And yeah. a wristwatch has got more power now. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's more technology in the iPhone I'm holding that was in the rocket that went to the moon or some statistic, isn't there? You know, just phenomenal. And, and, and anybody who says they could see it coming, I suspect... I'm not going to accuse anybody of dissembling with the truth, but I don't think anybody really knew. I'm sure you didn't, did you? <laughs> I'd, I'd be much richer than I am now if, uh, if exactly. I did. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we'd, we'd have all done a forest gov, wouldn't we, and accidentally bought shares in Apple, you know. <laughs> well, we didn't, did we? So maybe we didn't see it coming. Well, why did Bad Influence come to an end then? You'd have to ask Dawn Abbey, who was the controller of children's television at the time. I think this, again, is you know, hindsight. It was, there was a period where gaming fell out of favour. It, it sort of peaked, and then it sort of fell away again. And I, don't, and I, and I can't really remember the timing. I think it was, it was felt that bad influence had, had, had run its course. It had had however many series it needed. And there was a definite waning in interest in gaming, if my memory's right, and I'm prepared to be challenged. But I refer you back to that bit about the technological advancement. Everything was 
which he said we needed the next wave or the next generation or whatever it was, or somebody had to develop a new game. I don't know. It might have been that. And Games Master, uh, I don't know the timings for Games Master, whether it stayed on and carried on. It's been a very long time then before there was any gaming shows on TV at all, wasn't there? Yeah. You know, I mean, now you know, they do games reviews and click and they do them on Swipe on, on Sky and the BBC. And they're finally giving BAFTAs. Hallelujah, they're giving BAFTAs to people who design games now because it is a cinematic experience. Watching a game now or immersing yourself in a game and the graphics and the storytelling and the cinematography, it is a cinematic experience and people are going to get BAFTAs and I think they deserve them. But it seemed to, it seemed to fall out of favour or disappear from TV and TV didn't think that gaming was what you put on telly anymore. And, and it, was, it was felt that it was something that was happening in kids' rooms and they didn't want to watch it or talk about it. I think they missed a trick, to be honest. But you, you again, you'll know better than me. You were there at the time. After Mega Drive, SNES, PlayStation 1, did, did it all sort of... It's like skateboarding. Skateboarding was massive when I was in school. And then it disappeared again, and then it came back again, and now it's sort of a, sort of around. But it peaked, and then it go went away again. I don't know whether gaming did the yeah, same thing. Th- th- that That's a, f- a very long answer to a question which was essentially the controller of children's ITV at the time decided that we'd had enough of it. Um, maybe it may have had something to do with it wasn't attracting enough girls to TV. There may have been a, a, mild, a male bias to the programme. But honestly, I don't know. Again, there are people other than me you'd have to ask the question directly to. I just know it came to an end and I had to move on and do something else. Yeah, it seemed like all gaming TV kind of just took a big drop and uh, disappeared it did, from didn't the it? airwaves. I'm not imagining that, am I? There, there was definitely... I'm sure gaming carried on and people were as interested in gaming. It's just that TV kind of fell out of love with it, like it does. TV falls in love with something. For a while, it, you know, it, it'll fall in love with cookery shows or reality shows or something, and then it fell out of love with it, and it's taken a very long time for people in telly, because they see it as a bit of a rival as well, remember? Yeah. What you're saying is, hey, why don't you go away, switch off our TV shows and go and do something else which, with your television, like play a game, and why would they want to do that? It, it, I think it was a bit of that too. We, <laughs> we wanted you to watch television programs, not plug your snares into the TV and play games. Are you still in touch with Violet or any of the team? Only via Twitter um, and and the occasional... um, She's now with Gaz Top. You know, they're a couple. So um, I see Gaz occasionally at things and we sort of keep in touch via via that. Um, I I did um, Celebrity Pointless with Gaz (laughs) a couple of years ago. It's very nice to see him. Um, But only via Twitter and and casually. I see Patrick occasionally. Patrick... um, has no longer doesn't work in telly anymore. He lectures in media for uh, University of Leeds and University of York. So I've done I've been up to York and and, and done some stuff with his students up there about telly and stuff. So we we, we know where each other is and what each other's doing. Um, but we're at you know opposite ends of the country these days. And uh, uh, do we get back together? Not really very often. I don't know when the anniversary of the first bad influence is. That would be a fun thing to do. Maybe we should all go and have a beer on the anniversary of <laughs> Bad Influence. When did it start? 92? Something like that? Around then, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was 92. Yeah. 92. So that would be coming up, wouldn't it? Maybe maybe on an, maybe on an anniversary we'll go and have a pint. Well, you, you moved away from Kids TV. I know you did What's Up, Doc, didn't you, after um, Bad Influence? I mean, you moved away from Kids TV, and what did you kind of do after that then? And what, what you're doing? So the, yeah, the Saturday, the Saturday telly had continued during Bad Influence. There was a bit more of that. Then it went to Scotland. It became What's Up, Doc, with Pat Sharp and Yvette Fielding and various others. Uh, and then that ended. Um, I'd been dipping in and out of radio. I'd been doing stuff for what was originally called Radio 5 and is now 5 Live. I've been doing commercial radio. Um, I went to do uh, an awful lot of, a, a bit, you know, a bit of broom cupboard for grown-ups. We, I used to work for something called Challenge TV, which is still going, but we don't, not in the format I did it. We used to do a live version of um, a lot of the game shows between the programs. So I was doing live, it was evening primetime TV. We were doing live telephone versions of games. So if you watch Family Fortunes, we'd then do a 10-minute segment with people on the phones live playing Family Fortunes um, on the telly and winning prizes. It was great fun. Um, but then all the people who owned the copyrights to the games suddenly caught and done and went, hang on a minute, you can't play Family Fortunes without paying us a fat fee. <laughs> so we stopped doing that very quickly. But I did a lot of that. Um, I did a lot of cable and satellite telly, which was in its infancy, really, and 
but was but was growing. I, I did a lot of bits and pieces of radio and telly, and then I got back into radio pretty full time in about 2000, I think. And I've been back on the radio ever since in various on various guises on various stations. Well, Andy, it's been great to get the story of uh, Bad Influence. You know, Ravi and I were kids who grew up watching that show, and it was, you know, the Bad Influence in- informed us about what was going on in the, in the world of gaming before the internet. That's, we can look I, forward can to I ask you a question, then, as, as viewers? Yeah, of course. Did you do the data blast? Yeah, occasionally I did, yeah. My video yeah. used to flicker a bit too much, though. I could see some pages, but not the others. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I think they sometimes put too many frames in. Yeah. Uh, again, fans of Bad Influence will know what the data blast is, and I probably did not have to explain it. But yeah, I suspect it, depending on the quality of the pause on your VHS, it wasn't always as good. I often used to wonder, though, did people actually do it? I thought it was a genius idea. I thought, but will people really record it and stop? For, and, but they did because the cheats were on there and they wanted the cheats. Well, that's, that's, made, my, that's made my podcast, lads. <laughs> you did the data blast. It's made my podcast. I remember a friend of mine, Ricky, had one of the really high-end video recorders with a jog wheel and he could watch it, like, air all of it. He got the whole thing. Ooh, jog <laughs> wheel. There's one for the teenagers. <laughs> well, the cheats were like gold dust back then. So, yeah. you know. Oh, they were, weren't they? What was that famous one? Up, down, left, right? Oh, I can't remember. Uh, it was AB Mega back or something. C-A-A-B or something. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Yes, that's it. Yeah, it'll, it'll get you into the back door of some game. I've forgotten what it was. Oh, cheats. Do they even have those anymore? They probably don't bother, do they? Yeah, I think people hack them online sometimes, but you normally it's a, it's a pretty quick way to get banned, I think. <laughs> yeah. And these days, you don't need a cheat. You just go online and get a walkthrough, don't you? If yeah, you can't yeah, find a certain thing or you can't find this or you can't find that. I mean, the amount of time we could have saved with an, with an internet website with a walkthrough on it for after games I did, honestly, I'd have had been hours of my life I would have got back, but it wouldn't have been as much fun, would it? <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy, thanks for coming on and reminiscing with us. We've really enjoyed it. That's been very nice. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you for jogging my memory with so much stuff that I'd forgotten. Now, just before we go this week, I did promise a little Easter egg at the end of the show, and this is another way that you can help out the Retro Hour podcast. We found something really cool you might want to get your hands on, and if you buy it using our Amazon affiliate link, we'll get a little cut of the money. It'll help out the show. And these are things that we think you'll want to own. Now, we found a couple of really cool T-shirts at the moment that are by a company called Numskull. And we can both vouch for these because I've got T-shirts made by them. You've got the first thing that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I've got these official Atari socks. Now, I mentioned that I was wearing some Atari stuff, but you wouldn't see it because it's my socks. But, you know, if you're a sock man, these are well nice. Like, you can get uh, a pack of three. There's the Atari ones. They've got Missile Command and Breakout. So, you know, you've got all your kind of retro graphics on there. And it's quite good because I can actually now find matching ones. <laughs> Which is always a problem, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also another one I found here, I think my favourite of the, uh, the bunch this week, uh, official Atari Adventure T-shirt. Now, Adventure, obviously very early Atari 2600 game, recently been on the radar because of Ready Player One. If you've seen the prices on eBay, Adventure has gone through the roof, so this is going to be a very rare game in the future. I think a guy was trying to sell a copy of it for like five grand or something the other week, so... And it's very on trend right now, so if you come into any retro shows over summer, you want some cool kind of retro wear to put on while you're out and about, uh, we've got the links to our Easter eggs this week. Like I said, if you buy it, T-shirt's only a tenner as well. We'll put a link in. If you use the link on our website, we'll get a little cut of the money, and it'll help out the running of the podcast. Also, you know, if you're an Amazon Prime member, this all will be delivered instantly, and you have some really cool quality stuff here. Like, you know, I've bought T-shirts off eBay before, and I've bought stuff a couple of times. I've gone through the wash, and they're just faded, you know, they don't have that quality. My socks are still <laughs> looking prime. <laughs> and these are officially licensed as well, so yeah. Yeah, they are great quality. So if you want to help us out and get something really cool for the summer, have a look on our website. You'll find the links at theretrohour.com. That will see you next Friday. Ciao.